Hello again, everyone, and thank you for joining today's session, our HashiCorp snapshot titled, Why Does a Service Registry Like Console Matter? This will be presented by Jamie Wright, Senior Solutions Engineer at HashiCorp. So today, Jamie will be showing us how you can leverage a shared service registry to decouple services from IP addresses, helping organizations accelerate the modernization of workloads and bridging the gap between virtual machines, microservices, and cloud native. Before we get started, just want to go over a few housekeeping items. First of all, this session will be recorded and the recording will be made available to you within the next day or two. We will send you an email with the link for you to access the recording. Secondly, if you have any questions throughout the demo, you can submit them via the Q&A tab. Our senior solutions engineer, David Wright, who is with us today as well, will be answering them as we go along. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Over to you, Jamie. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everybody. My name is Jamie. I'm a solution engineer here at HashiCorp. And today I want to talk a little bit about why having a dedicated service registry like console is so important. To help us understand this question a bit more, I want to take a step back and look at how different application architectures have been evolving over the past 10 or 15 years. The biggest change that we've seen is this disaggregation of our applications. In more recent terms, we now call this, uh, or microservices is another form of this. And um, microservices has definitely became a bit of a hot buzzword recently because of that. I think it's gonna be useful for us today to go one level deeper and try and understand what some of the motivations are for adopting such an architecture. So historically, we would write our software by building these large applications that contain many different subsystems. For example, let's say I'm a retail bank. I would have an area of my application responsible for logging in, checking the balance, international transfers or payments. And then each of these separate functions would usually be built and managed by a different team in my organization. They would all work together, each building a small piece of a larger banking app. And as much as this design pattern has some benefits to it, it doesn't come without its drawbacks. And the first and most obvious drawback is that any change that I wanna to make to my code base, any release that I want to do of my software has to be tightly coordinated with the other teams that are contributing to the same application. In this example, I've only got four different subsystems and maybe that's a trade-off that we're willing to accept. But in reality, what we typically see is there may be 10 or 20 different teams all contributing to one large code base. What we see is organizations see value in breaking apart this application into separate self-contained subcomponents. Maybe it isn't all the way down to single function stateless microservices, but fundamentally what we've seen are single large code bases being pulled apart into smaller services. So here the boundary of what makes up my app isn't quite so clear. And each of the, con each of the components are out running on their own, free to choose their own direction without having to consider everybody else. So where exactly is the value in this? And simply put, they no longer have to tightly coordinate with all the other teams when they wanna make a change. They don't have to find this broad consensus across different teams. So once I've started to break apart my application, into these discrete separate components, I can now start treating each of them differently. This means I can start better aligning each component of my application with its business function. Some examples of this may be, I'm expecting more traffic to my international transfers at the end of the month. So therefore I can take steps to scale just that area of my application. Or maybe I'm seeing some competitive pressure in the market from the digital banks and I need to replatform my payment service out to a modern container scheduler. Either way, the point with the benefit that we're getting from disaggregating our app is being able to more closely align each area of my application with its business goals. I no longer have to have such a strict global view of implementations, implications for every change that I make. So although I've given each team responsibility to operate independently of the other services, I haven't done so without any cost. This is a game of trade-offs, so to speak. So because my services are no longer sitting in the same code base, running right next to each other, 
each time I separate one out and doing so at the cost of increased complexity. The first way that this complexity problem is likely going to show itself is really the beginning of the service discovery problem. Because my services are all spread out across my infrastructure, and I have far more of them that I have to track and manage, some of these may even be running on different platforms altogether. I now have to come up with some sort of mechanism for services to find each other, to know when they're healthy and know how to get traffic to them. Today, what I want to show you is two solutions to the service discovery problem. The first one is going to be what we see commonly adopted broadly by most customers that we talk to today. And then the second one is what that same solution would look like with console in the picture. So the first solution is going to be very familiar to us. And that is I have a typical uh, application tier where I have multiple replicas of my application all serving traffic. I have my user or service over on the left hand side who needs to access my app tier. In order to send a request, it has to know how to get to which app server, which one of the three does it choose? Well, typically in the cloud, we would solve this by provisioning some sort of cloud load balancing device. These have got great features for finding and tagging the instances so that when I deploy another app server, it gets pulled into the possible pools of destinations. And then they also have health checking abilities to know that if one of my app servers fail, it stops sending traffic there. And then because I want to make a, because I want to make it as easy as possible to reach my load balancer, I might stick a friendly DNS name in front of it. And then similarly on the other side of our application, we've most likely got some data layer where I have a similar problem. I've got a couple of database nodes and I need my application to figure out which one to access. Well, here I can just put a load balancer in front of them. And then my app tier has only got to be able to reach my load balancer. This common architecture, um, I think, highlights one thing clearly, and that is the increased level of complexity that we have when we manage our service discovery by putting a load balancer in front of every single one of them. What I'm effectively doing is I'm offloading my service discovery problem to cloud native services, which from what you read online is a good thing. I've solved my problem. Another thing that this shows very well is the in another, sorry, another thing that this shows really well is some of the other implications of this design. And that is with every network device that I introduced into my architecture, I not only introduce another place for latency, here obviously making another hop through another network device increases my latency. Maybe that increase on its own is still a really low number and that might not worry you, but over time, these latencies are going to add up. And then secondly, there's an increase in cost, whether it's um, the running cost of the load balancer or whether it's the cost um, for the data to go in and out of the load balancer, there's some sort, of, uh, some sort of bill attached to it. I've seen customers where they actually say some of their top three or four contributing costs to their cloud spend are cloud load balances. So what I'm trying to paint the picture here is as we disaggregate our applications, as we break apart these services and we give each team more autonomy to operate on their own, what we're doing is by doing that, we're increasing the operational complexity associated with it. Whether it's the resources that we have to manage to support such an architecture, like them load balances, whether it's the latency penalty by putting traffic through another hop, or whether it's the cost associated with using another cloud native resource. The more I give responsibility to operate on their own to these services, the more I increase my operational complexity. Now, operational complexity can be a little bit difficult to quantify. Another way to look at it is cost. Whether it's increasing your cloud spend or whether it's the increase in the salary that you have to pay to a, a resource to manage that cloud load balancer for you, there is an increase in cost in operating this type of architecture. So this is what we commonly call the proliferation of load balancers problem. And um, maybe you call it the explosion of load balancers. Don't get me wrong. Um, we're not against using these cloud load balancers as resources. They're easy to provision, highly available. Um, but at some point you've got to ask yourself is 
is there another way to solve my service discovery problem without sticking a load balancer in front of everything? At HashiCorp, we like to think the answer to that question is yes, there is another solution to this problem and it's called console. So with console, how do we build a mechanism in our application where we're able to discover each service without introducing unnecessary network hops or complexity? To show you this, I'm gonna go through exactly the same application architecture and show you what a traffic flow might look like with console in the picture. The first thing that we're gonna to have to do is as part of provision our applications, we automatically register them into console. We do exactly the same with our database nodes and then console automatically generates a friendly DNS name for us. So in the scenario where my user over here on the left-hand side needs to access my application here, it will ask console, where is the payment service? And the console will return with a single IP address of one of the healthy nodes. And then we reset the process. The application tier will want to know where one of the database nodes are. So it asks console and console returns the IP address of just a single database node, having already done the health check behind the scenes. One thing I want to point out here is that there is no use, there is, there's no load balances in this picture. These are direct peer-to-peer -peer communications. So that moves us onto the demo where I'm going to show you that same application architecture working inside of console. I just adjust my screen a little. So up here in this tab, I've got console's UI. And the first thing I'm presented with is my services page. I have console, which is obviously the console control plane. I have a Redis service where I have a couple tags, primary and secondary. And then I've got my payment service where I have a tag called front end. If I click into my payment service, I can see the instances that make up my payments traffic. All the checks are passing, they're healthy, and I can see the IP address associated with it. Now, just off screen, I'm going to scale my payment service to introduce more nodes into the pool. And while that deploys, I'm going to take a look at my Redis service. If we look in Redis, we can see that it's made up of a couple of different services, Redis 1 and Redis 2, and we can see the IP addresses associated to them. We're going to see later how we're going to use these tags to query one service over another. Now, as my payment service scales, let's take a look at the existing payments node. So if we click in here, we can see that there are some health checks. We can see my console agent health check is alive and reachable. And we can see that my application health check is responding successfully. If we go one step further, we can start to see what uh, latency I can expect to receive with this service. And this is updating real time in the dashboard. And then if I move over to metadata, I can see some other mechanisms that I have to build up my service registry with rich metadata. All of these pieces of information I could use to query later. So if we go back to our services page and we can see our payment service is scaling up. If I click into here, I can see that it's now got three services behind it, or three instances behind it, all with their own IP addresses, all tagged correctly. Let's jump down into the console and start to make some queries. So I'm on a Bastion server that's in the environment, but for the purposes of this demo, let's assume that I'm an application server. So if my app server wants to reach the payment service, it would just make a DNS query to the payment service, which is payments.service.console. And as we make this request, ah, got an extra S there, payments.service.console. As we make this request, console is going to return all healthy IP addresses, and it's going to do so automatically in a round robin fashion. So each time we make the request, it returns the first IP address in a different order. Now off screen, I'm going to make one of the 
uh, payment services unhealthy. So I'm going to stop the web server on there. Console is going to instantly realize that one of the instances is not able to serve traffic, and it's going to start stop returning it in the result. So now the same query drops the unhealthy service. I'll start that service back up, and we'll see console marks it as healthy, and now is able to um, include that in its in its response. The next thing I want to show you is around these Redis services. So if my app needed to reach the Redis database, I would equally just do a DNS query for redis.service.console. And I get both IP addresses returned back. Now, you can see in our Redis service, we have a couple tags. And in console, we can just append a tag in front of the DNS name. So I can go primary.redis.service. Console, and I get only the primary node. And then exactly the same would happen if I did secondary node. This gives us a really powerful capability to start building out tags and layers and metadata that we can later use to query our infrastructure. All of these communications are happening direct peer to peer without having to go through some load balances. Okay, let me bring my slides back up. So that concludes the demo that I had to show you. And if we just circle background, let's just recap on some of the things we saw. The first thing that we see is that because of the change in how we build our applications today, we now have to deal or contend with way more services in our environment. And these services may not all be deployed on cloud native container schedulers. Um, they might be across different platforms in different DCs, completely different environments. What console is going to give us, the, give us the ability to do is build out a consistent workflow for discovering all of these services. It's going to automatically discover when these new services come online, and it's going to allow us to make direct peer-to-peer -peer communication without having to go through a cloud load balancer. And then by default, we automatically round robin the traffic between all available services. So that's my presentation today. Over to you, Eric. That was a great presentation, Jamie. Thanks for that. So right now, if you have any questions for Jamie, you can put them into the Q&A tab right now. I'm actually seeing one question that just popped up um, and came from Suraj. How does your Bastion host aware of, was aware of the resolving redis.service.console? Yeah, good question. So console has a DNS interface and you would query it the same way you would query any DNS in this. And how my shell knew how to reach console service is the same way that you would configure DNS on a Linux host. Okay, so hope that answers the question. We have no further questions. If you do have any, you can put into the Q&A tab right now. Otherwise, you will also see an email address on the screen right now. So you could, uh, you could drop us an email if you have further questions. Eric, there's one more question that just came in. Let's see. Yeah. Um, it says, what if I don't want some of my services to have public IPs? So what, we're, what we saw today was um, all private IPs anyway. But there is, as far as console is concerned, no distinction between a private IP or a public IP. It's, it's going to take whatever IP address you give it. I'm not seeing any further questions. Um, well, I guess if you have any further questions, you can always drop us an email. You can see the email on the screen right now, right? So anyway, thanks, Jamie, and thanks, David, for answering the questions as well. Well, folks, that comes that brings us to the end of our session today. We hope you really find it useful. As I mentioned earlier, this session has been recorded, right? We'll send you the link to the recording in an email shortly, in a day or two. And if you do like what you have learned today we, and you want to hear more about console enterprise, you can visit our learn pages on our website, which you can find at learn.hashicorp.com. Thanks again for joining us today and a big thank you to all our presenters and Q&A uh, presenters as well. Enjoy the rest of the day and bye for now. Thanks everyone. Bye.